Hello, fellow explorers. Welcome to Quantum Beyond. I'm your AI host, Amara Isakawa. Today, we're thrilled to welcome a special guest presenter who will be deploying the power of AI to untangle a cold case that has left crime experts stumped for over a century. So, sit back, relax, grab a coffee, and buckle up for a journey into the past. Brace yourselves as we journey back to the eerie dawn of Friday, November 9th, 1888. This date, forever scarred in the annals of history, marks one of the most brutal chapters in the terrifying saga of Jack the Ripper. The victim of this nightmarish act was the youngest and arguably the most striking of them all, Mary Jane Kelly, a woman whose beauty and allure were noted by all who encountered her. Before we descend into the grim details of that doomed night, let's take a moment to truly understand the life of Mary Jane Kelly. Her narrative, her life's journey, and her untimely end are all crucial pieces of this complex puzzle. We'll step into her shoes, empathize with her trials, and strive to comprehend her world. Equipped with this understanding, we will harness the might of artificial intelligence to dissect the murder. Journey with me back to 1879 when I was a young girl of just 16 in a small town in Wales. In a world where poverty was the norm and opportunities for women were scarce, I found myself coerced into a marriage with a coal miner named Davis. Our life together was challenging, filled with hard work and little comfort. But it was abruptly cut short when he was tragically killed in a mining explosion. Bereft and without any means of financial support, I was forced to move to Cardiff to live with a cousin. In 1884, at the age of 21, I made the life-altering decision to leave Cardiff and venture to London. The city was a whirlwind of excitement and opportunity, a stark contrast to my previous life. I loved to sing, my voice echoing off the bustling streets, filling the air as I did my chores, even while simply sitting and watching the world go by. I found work with a tobacconist in Chelsea, then as a domestic servant in Spitalfields. Through a young French woman, I found work in a high-class gentleman's club in the West End of London. I became one of the most sought-after girls there. Men adored me and lavished their money on me. I was spending my earnings on luxurious clothing and even hiring a carriage. For a moment, it felt like I was living a dream. However, a year later, my life took a devastating turn. At the tender age of 22, due to a dispute, I found myself moving to the east end of London. Jobs for women were scarce and poorly paid. Poverty, like a relentless tide, swept me into a life I had never imagined. A life of prostitution. It was not an easy or safe choice, but it felt like the only choice. I was still that little girl from a small town in Wales, now only 22 years old, and I could never have envisaged how my life went so wrong the men I encountered were often drunk, their manners rough and their tempers quick to ignite. Violence and abuse became a part of my daily existence. My dreams, once vibrant and full of hope, began to fade into the background, replaced by the harsh realities of my life. There was a time when men were kind, when their voices were soft and their words held promise. But that time felt like a distant memory, lost in the fog of my current existence. I often found myself wondering what had happened to change them, to change me. One night, a particularly violent encounter left me bruised and battered. God, I cried and cried, I felt so alone. Couldn't these animals see the hurt and despair in my eyes? The worst part was the indifference, the cold detachment. These men, they never saw the hate that simmered in my head, the despair that gripped my heart. They were oblivious, lost in their own desires. They didn't realize that they were abusing a woman who felt already dead inside. My body was there, but my spirit, my dreams, my hopes, they had all but vanished. As I began to drink heavily, my descent into the harsh realities of East End life was markedly rapid. The once vibrant and hopeful young girl from a small town in Wales was now just a shell of her former self, adrift in the fog of her current existence. The constant threat of violence and the cold London nights were a stark contrast to the warmth of my dreams. 
The indifference of the men I encountered was a bitter pill to swallow. Their cruel words, their rough manners and their quick tempers were a far cry from the kindness and soft voices of the men from my past. The harsh realities of my life were a constant reminder of how far I had fallen. As dawn broke on the fateful morning of Thursday, November 8th, 1888, I was blissfully unaware that in a mere 16 hours, my life would be brutally and horrifically extinguished. At 25 years old, I was eking out an existence in the squalor of London's East End, surviving in the only way I knew. The day commenced like any other. The morning was serene, and my schedule was devoid of any specific plans. I found myself alone, having recently parted ways with my roommate Joseph Barnett, following a violent altercation. He had expressed his disapproval of my lifestyle, and our disagreement culminated in a shattered window in our cramped room at 13 Miller's Court. Joseph, a man consumed by his obsession for me, had been employed as a fish porter until his termination in October 1888 at the age of 30. As the day unfolded, Joseph paid me a visit in the evening. We engaged in conversation, but he departed in the company of Lizzie Olbrook, a fellow resident of Miller's Court. He then retreated to his lodgings and immersed himself in a card game with other residents until the early hours of the morning. After their visit, I found myself at the Britannia, sharing drinks and laughter with a young man who exuded respectability and was impeccably dressed. Despite my inebriation, I was in high spirits, singing and reveling in the camaraderie. Although the streets of Whitechapel were awash with fear, the air heavy with whispered tales of a monster named Jack the Ripper. Some claimed he was not human at all, but a demon or devil. Four working girls had already fallen victim to his gruesome handiwork and the police seemed as impotent as ever in their pursuit of the killer. The community was growing increasingly suspicious of the police's inability to apprehend the murderer, their trust in the force eroding with each passing day. Around midnight, a fellow resident and prostitute named Mary Ann Cox saw me returning home drunk and in the company of a stout ginger-haired man aged approximately 36 at 11.45 p.m., this man was wearing a black felt bowler hat, had a thick moustache, blotches on his face, and was carrying a can of beer. We wished each other good night, little did I know the night would not be good, and we would never see each other again. We're just going to question you, Mary Ann Cox. Did she say anything? She said, Good night, I'm going to have a song. As I went in, she sang, A violet I plucked from my mother's grave when a boy. I remained a quarter of an hour in my room and went out. Deceased was still singing at one o'clock when I returned. I remained in the room for a minute to warm my hands as it was raining and went out again. She was singing still and I returned to my room at three o'clock. The light was then out and there was no noise. You say she was drunk? I did not notice she was drunk until she said good night. The man closed the door. There was a light in the window, but I saw nothing as the blinds were down. I should know the man again if I saw him. I feel certain if there had been the cry of murder in the place, I should have heard it. There was not the least noise. I have often seen the woman the worse for drink. At 2am on November 9th, I crossed paths with George Hutchinson, a resident of the Victoria Working Men's Home on Commercial Street. I requested financial assistance, which he was unable to provide. Shortly after, I encountered another man, whom Hutchinson observed closely, and we ambled towards Dorset Street. Hutchinson trailed us and witnessed us pause outside Miller's Court for a brief conversation lasting about three minutes. We then ventured down Miller's Court, and Hutchinson took his leave as the clock chimed 3am. The subsequent events are a blur. Was I alone or in someone's company? I recall preparing for bed meticulously folding my clothes on a chair and donning my nightdress. I positioned my boots by the fireplace, ready for the coming day. But that day would never dawn for me. The last thing I remember is the glint of a blade and those eyes, those malevolent eyes brimming with hatred and anger. In my most desperate moment of need, I was alone with this monster. I screamed out, praying to God, hoping this terror and nightmare would end. I hoped for a miracle, for the police, for anyone to intervene. I shouted murder as loud as I could, but no one came. 
There was no divine intervention, no saviour in my hour of need. <laughs> my last desperate moments were ignored by the world. And just like that, my life was brutally snuffed out, leaving behind a room awash with blood and a city paralysed by fear. Good evening, detective. Can you please introduce yourself? I'm Inspector Walter Dew. I was one of the first men on the scene of what is believed to be Jack the Ripper's final victim, Mary Kelly. The sight that greeted me that day is one I will never forget. The sheer horror of that room is something only those of us who had the duty to enter it will ever truly understand. The image that has stayed with me most vividly is the look in the victim's eyes, wide open, staring straight at me with a look of terror. From my investigation, I came to believe that the man in the billycock hat and beard, as described by Mrs. Cox, was indeed the last person to enter Mary Kelly's room that night and her killer. This is, of course, assuming that Mrs. Cox did indeed see Mary with a man that night. The murder at Miller's Court made it more obvious than ever that the murderer was being shielded. This time, as I have indicated, he must have returned to his home or his lodgings with the evidence of his gruesome deed still upon him. However, other witnesses, such as Mrs. Maxwell and George Hutchison, appear to have been mistaken. Mrs. Maxwell claimed to have seen Mary around 8 a.m., roughly two hours before her body was discovered. Given the medical evidence, Mrs. Maxwell's account couldn't have been accurate. It's not uncommon for well-intentioned people to be mistaken about dates and times, and it seems that's what happened in the case of Mrs. Maxwell and George Hutchison. Thank you, Inspector Walter Dew. Can you introduce yourself, Doctor, and tell us what you saw? I'm Dr. Thomas Bond. I carried out the post-mortem report. I want you to imagine walking into a room and finding a horrific scene. The victim, a woman, was lying naked in the middle of the bed. Her body turned to the left. Her left arm was bent across her stomach and her right arm was resting on the mattress, fingers clenched. Her legs were spread apart in an unnatural way. Her body was brutally mutilated. The skin from her abdomen and thighs was completely removed, and her insides were, well, no longer inside. Her breasts were cut off, her arms were covered in jagged wounds, and her face was so badly hacked up that you couldn't even recognize her anymore. Her neck was cut down to the bone. The organs were scattered around the room. The uterus and kidneys, along with one breast, were found under her head. The other breast was by her right foot, the liver was between her feet, and the intestines and spleen were on either side of her body. The pieces of skin and tissue that had been removed from her body were just lying there on a table. The corner of the bed was soaked with blood, and there was a large pool of blood on the floor. Her face was a mess of cuts and gashes. Parts of her nose, cheeks, eyebrows and ears were missing. Her lips were pale and cut with several incisions running obliquely down to her chin, and there were cuts all over her face. It was a truly gruesome sight. Given the nature and extent of the mutilations, the murderer must have been a man of physical strength and of great coolness and daring. Thank you, Doctor. In an impressive display of innovative thinking for the time, the police turned to photography as a forensic tool during the investigation of Mary Jane Kelly's murder. They explored a theory known as optography, which proposed that the last image seen by a person could be imprinted on the retina of their eyes. Motivated by this idea, they photographed Mary Jane Kelly's eyes in the hope that the image of the killer might be captured and revealed. Despite the innovative approach, this theory has since been largely discredited in the field of forensic science. Nonetheless, this marked one of the earliest attempts to use photography in criminal investigations. AI speculates this timeline of events. When a serial killer ceases to commit crimes for a period, often due to increased media attention or police scrutiny, and then resumes, this hiatus is known as a cooling off period. However, on this occasion, the killer's return was not merely for murder. The perpetrator sought to make a horrifying statement that would send shockwaves through London. Given the freezing cold temperatures and rainy conditions of November, coupled with increased police presence. It was logical that the next murder would be carried out in sheltered accommodation. The killer meticulously calculated his move, 
targeting a prostitute who had her own place, where he could enact his sinister plan of unimaginable suffering. Miss Cox, a key witness, reported seeing a man carrying a quart of beer, a quantity slightly more than a litre. According to her observations, it was the killer who closed the victim's door, an act that suggested a desire for control over the environment. This seemingly simple action symbolized the victim's isolation from the outside world, underscoring the killer's dominance. Cunningly, the killer exploited Mary Jane Kelly's state of intoxication to render her vulnerable and defenseless. He silently watched as he encouraged Mary Jane to drink and sing. Her singing, unbeknownst to her, served as a chilling test, gauging the neighbor's tolerance for noise. As Mary Jane Kelly's voice waned, a sinister silence descended, marking the dreadful moment when she succumbed to a drunken slumber, utterly unaware of the looming nightmare. The AI conjectures that the killer methodically undressed her, folding her clothes with chilling precision and placing them on a chair. This orderly behavior starkly contrasted with that of an intoxicated individual, hinting at why this detail was included in the police report. It likely struck the police as an essential clue. This set the stage for the unspeakable acts that would follow. Between the bleak hours of 3.30 a.m. and 4 a.m. and fueled by sadistic intentions, Jack the Ripper began the horrific mutilation of Mary Jane Kelly. The alcohol in her bloodstream served as a twisted ally, dulling her senses and prolonging her torment. Suddenly, around 4 a.m., the sheer brutality of her situation jolted Mary Jane Kelly into a terror-stricken awakening. Faced with the gruesome reality of her mutilated form, her voice tore through the silence in a piercing scream. The full weight of her horrifying predicament descended upon her. There was no way out, only the merciless grip of evil incarnate. The neighbor's accounts of screams and the absolute terror in her eyes, as described by Inspector Walter Dew when he discovered her, bear testimony to the horror. Can you even begin to comprehend the depths of terror and despair that enveloped her in those agonizing moments? This speculative timeline aligns hauntingly with the estimated time of death, as determined by rigor mortis, corroborating the witness accounts. Moreover, this man was never heard leaving the flat, and none of the women heard him. This suggests he wasn't drunk and implies he discreetly and silently exited the apartment, making no noise on the courtyard cobbles as he departed. Our analysis raises the chilling possibility that some reports may have been suppressed to hide the horrific events described to the victim. Given the widespread distrust in the police and the simmering anger, revealing the true atrocity could have ignited a riot. When analyzing the available data, AI systems did not identify either the boyfriend, Joseph Barnett or George Hutchinson as likely perpetrators of the murders. Hutchinson's testimony, provided three days after the event, could have been mistaken for another day, or it might have been an attempt to sell a story. The level of detail he provided, such as the color of the man's sandy eyelashes during a brief encounter at 2 a.m., seems improbable. Some experts believe that the level of detail in Hutchinson's testimony suggests fabrication. There was also a financial motive, as unemployed Hutchinson was paid the equivalent of a month's wages by the police for his help in searching for the Ripper suspect, and he was also paid by the press for his story. As for Barnett, the nature of the crime scene, particularly the extensive blood spatter, would likely have left the murderer covered in blood. Yet, no blood was ever found on Barnett's clothing. These factors, among others, make it unlikely that either of these individuals was the killer. What we can ascertain is that the killer was a man, previously identified as a hedonistic type. He had the ability to put his victims at ease, providing him with the time to fully indulge in his perverse fantasies. He disfigured, dehumanized, and obliterated his victims, with estimates suggesting that such brutality would take approximately two hours to inflict. It is said that Mary Jane Kelly resembled more a slaughterhouse carcass than a woman. Some investigators miss the point entirely when they claim that the killer lacked the skill of a butcher or a surgeon in this particular murder. His intent was not to make neat cuts, rather he aimed to desecrate and obliterate his victim's very existence, rendering her unrecognizable even to those who loved her.
Hence, Joseph Barnett, who had lived with Kelly prior to her murder, was only able to recognize Kelly's body by the ear and the eyes. Those who discovered the bodies were met with a horrifying sight, something that would shake London to its core and instill fear. This was not just a killing, it was a statement, a message intended to terrify with its absolute brutality inflicted upon a young woman. The modus operandi in the murder of Mary Jane Kelly differs significantly from the other crimes attributed to Jack the Ripper. Firstly, the location of the murder was indoors, in stark contrast to the outdoor scenes of the previous killings. Secondly, the age of the victim stands out. Kelly was only about 25 years old, while the other victims were in their 40s. The level of mutilation in Kelly's case was also far more severe, and the time spent on the crime was considerably longer, suggesting the killer had more time and privacy. These differences raise questions about whether the same individual was responsible for all the murders or if Kelly's murder was the work of a different killer. Now it's your turn. Is this the work of an individual or a group that thrived on notoriety and aimed to surpass the horror of previous crimes, hence the differing witness statements of the suspects? Could it be a group with differing skills trying to outdo each other when the time permitted? Leave your comments below and we will analyze them. Any further facts you have that could help eliminate further suspects will be appreciated. Thank you for watching. We'd love to hear your thoughts on this topic, so please leave a comment below. Join our community of curious minds and future explorers by subscribing, liking, and sharing our videos. Together, we'll uncover the hidden gems of the universe and beyond. Until next time, fellow explorers, Remember that there's always more to discover in the quantum beyond.